Welcome to our April webinar, Understanding Expressions of Emotion When Caring for a Loved One with Dementia. We're honored to have Maureen Siriani of Country Meadows presenting today. I'll introduce her in a moment, but I would like to introduce um, two colleagues that are joining us, Lauren O'Neill and Christine Haythorn. Lauren is our marketing and design guru and Christine Haythorn is our CEO. David Von Hofen and Emily Russo are somewhere in the background doing some other Parkinson's Foundation, Western Pennsylvania work. Today, Maureen, who is an expert in dementia, she's an educator. She is also involved with marketing for Country Meadows. She is delighted and very willing to present on such an important topic regarding dementia, which as you be, may be well aware of, it can affect someone with Parkinson's. Maureen Siriani is a motivated and compassionate care provider and educator. She's the memory care outreach specialist and marketing director for Country Meadows Retirement Community in Bridgeville. And she has been working in this field for over 26 years. Maureen is a certified validation method teacher. And she'll talk more about this method during the presentation. She is delighted to be here as we are, and she's gonna talk all about um, ways to help someone that has dementia in the best way possible for both you and the person living with dementia. Maureen, thank you, and I'll let you take it away. Casey, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you all very much for joining in. I'm gonna try and live up to uh, the expectations that Laura set that every uh, every one of your presentations has, has, has been wonderful and exceptional. And uh, so I'm hopeful to, uh, to provide you all with some support, uh, some compassion, and, uh, and some understanding, um, not just about, um, you know, somebody living with a challenge with their memory, um, but just, just about the day-to-day the, the -day, um, opportunities that you as caregivers have to, to really step into someone else's world and make an impact um, so that it isn't so isolating. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna share my screen so that way we can, um, I'll kind of take a look at uh, the presentation. And like Casey said, I'm more than happy to, um, how about I started at the beginning? More than happy to give you guys all um, copies of the slides. And, and um, you know, I, I know when I'm viewing a Zoom, sometimes I'll have my cell phone out with me. I take a screenshot of uh, the slide that's playing because I want to remember something. Um, so as Casey said, I'm a certified validation method teacher. So I teach people how to communicate with someone who has Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. And, um, and so when we talk about Parkinson's disease, that, that sometimes does have some memory impairment or challenges that, that go along with that diagnosis. And, um, and so that's where we get the term related dementia. And um, again, my contact information is up if anybody um, has more in-depth conversation that they'd like to have with me, um, please feel free to give me a call or send me an email um, at any time. But we're gonna go ahead in and um, we're gonna start to talk about expressions of emotion. Um, the unpopular term is behaviors. And I really don't like to use the term behaviors. Um, I do like to say expressions of emotion because when you really truly think about what an expression of emotion is, um, you know, it stems from a stimulant and it stems from somebody trying to communicate to you in the best that they can and sometimes in the only way that they can. And um, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna jump right in. Um, again, what does that behavior mean? Um, why does a behavior or why does an expression of emotion happen? Um, what can cause an expression of emotion or a behavior? You know, oftentimes, you know, when you use the word behavior, it kind of stems from being a, a judgmental. Why is she acting that way? Or, you know, look at him acting that way. 
um, you know, we really want to kind of delve a little bit deeper into understanding what those triggers are, what causes someone to react and respond. Um, and then how do we as caregivers understand what our loved one or the person that we're caring for is experiencing and, and how are they trying to communicate that to us? And, um, and then again, the last part here is how do we prepare ourselves to receive what someone is trying to express? Um, oftentimes- Maureen, would you, I'm sorry to interrupt Maureen, but would you please advance the slides? Sure. Can you see that? You're not able to see that? I think it's on- um, Should be on like, slide number three. I think it's still on like it's still on the slideshow that you would see. It's not on the um like the presenter. I think you need to start the slideshow if that makes sense. Let's see if we can get it going. Are you you still don't see it yet? No. I know we practiced it once and you had it. We did have it. So moment. Hmm. I think yeah. if you go over to slide, yep, we're good. Here we go. You can see it now? Yes, thanks. Yep, thank okay. you. Right. Absolutely. Thank you for recognizing that. I'm not seeing, obviously, what you're seeing. Um, so again, what I was talking about is how do we prepare ourselves to receive what someone else is, is trying to convey? And oftentimes, um, you know, I, I tell people, you want to take a moment, take a breath, and kind of really recognize and, and sometimes even ask the person that you're caring for, are you yelling to me or are you yelling at me? You know, because when you think about um, when someone's trying to be understood, sometimes just out of frustration, um, you know, emotions can get heightened. And um, so there's a difference uh, for caregivers to recognize when someone is conveying to them, um, you know, what it feels like in their moments. Um, so knowing what we know, again, behavior is a form of communication and all behavior has meaning. Um, when we talk about behavior, um, it's influenced by either the physical environment or the social factors or the social stimulants that are around us every day. Um, sometimes there is a history of psychological or emotional or even cognitive challenges that stem from someone's life story. And when we talk about that, I think it's really important that um, you know, we recognize uh, not just the past as being experiences that we've had, but everything that's ever happened to us in our past has helped shape us into the people that we are today. And when you really take a moment to look at someone's life story and life history and recognize you know, some triggers from the past or some experiences that have caused them to have, you know, great pride or great, great anxiety or, um, you know, have an emotional attachment. Um, it kind of helps us in real time find ways to support those that we are caring for in, in, in this experience in their lives. Um, a lot of it has to do on just historical factors. Um, and then how to meet and recognize the needs before a behavior or an expression of emotion can become a challenge. So again, when we talk about what a behavior is, again, it's an expression of emotion. When a baby cries, it's pre-linguistic pre communication. They're trying to tell us either I'm tired or I'm hungry or I'm wet, or I'm bored, I'm overstimulated, I'm too hot, I'm too cold. Um, and how does a parent respond? You know, what happens when a parent doesn't respond? Uh, sometimes you notice that a baby will cry louder or, or get angrier um, if their needs are not met. And the same thing happens with, with us just at any age and, and, um, and time in our lives when our needs are not met, our reactions can grow in, in more emotional ways and reactions and responses. And um, so I think it's important that we look at um, behavior as a form of communication. Obviously, the, the, the easiest would be verbal communication. But when we talk about nonverbal communication, we talk about someone's body language. We talk about 
you know, the way they sit in the chair, if somebody rolls their eyes or um, has a different gesture or facial expression. Um, let's not forget tone of voice. Um, these are all forms of communication. Um, you know, when a, when a wife is frustrated and the husband asks, are you okay? And she says, I'm fine, everything's fine. You can tell in the tone of someone's voice, they may not be fine. Um, so again, a behavior is an outward expression. Um, so most of us use expressions of emotion to communicate you know, what we feel. Um, and I use a Penguins hockey game as the example because you could have a television on mute and you know, you're, you're watching the crowd, watching the puck, and then all of a sudden somebody scores and, and everyone erupts. And if you watch somebody erupt on mute, you know exactly how they're feeling in that moment, just based on their body language and their expressions of emotion on their face. Um, so again, I think that's kind of a neat little exercise. Uh, if you're watching a sports uh, show on TV or a game on TV, put it on mute for a moment and watch the body language. So when an individual doesn't have words or doesn't use the words anymore, whether uh, you know, intellectual skills such as reasoning um, and communication through language are lost. And this is an advanced decline of uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. Um, they have to rely on their behaviors to express their needs and their emotions. Um, so someone that's crying, they might be sig signaling pain or fear or anger. Um, sometimes people cry when they're happy, you know? Um, if they recognize you, you wanna watch the brow line. I always tell everybody, you want to watch the brow line because that really does um, it, telltale signs to if someone is happy or is experiencing any stress or even pain. Um, somebody that might be pushing food away might be signaling to you their lack of hunger or of dislike or just frustration. Um, you know, sometimes when, when too many stimulants are in front of somebody that has a cognitive challenge, um, that, that overwhelming sense of just make it go away or push it away um, does occur. So when we talk about behaviors, um, again, they all have significance and meaning. Um, behaviors should never just be viewed as random or purposeless um, happenings. Behaviors are an attempt to communicate with an increasingly confusing world. Um, and I use showering as an example. Um, and I think this is really important because if somebody is in the early stages of their cognitive challenge with dementia, they might say, I'm not getting in that shower. Um, and we have to ask ourselves as care partners and caregivers, we can ask ourselves, why are they behaving this way? But we would never ask the, the person with the challenge, why are you doing that? Um, why is it as a kind of an accusatory uh, tone to it? it? Might be Maureen, why is your hair styled like that? Maureen, why are you wearing that outfit today? Um, there's kind of a demand for an answer when we, when we put why out there. Um, and so we can ask ourselves why, but we never ask somebody with a challenge that we're caring for why. Um, because that person may think that they've already had a shower. They've already provided care for themselves. Or that person might not trust the caregiver. You know, if you have a paid caregiver and it's not a family member, it might be that you know the, the, the person with the cognitive challenge just doesn't, doesn't trust them or is not familiar with them. And so they immediately resist care. Um, a lot of times people with dementia um, and in the elderly in general have a fear of falling and bathrooms can be very overwhelming and very intimidating. And um, so that fear of falling is a large, large reason why people resist um, ADL activities of daily living, care, personal care, such as showering, bathing, um, or you know, even toileting. Um, also too, if directions are too confusing, if too many words are being used, they kind of get lost uh, in, in the shuffle. I always uh, refer back to Charlie Brown's teacher. Uh, if, if any of you are familiar with, uh, with Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. The, the kids couldn't understand what the teacher was saying. And, um, and so sometimes when we're using too many words, somebody with the, um, can really just end up tuning us out because it's just too hard to follow along. And I also remind people about time of day. Um, it's really important that you recognize your loved one's routine and, and have a routine um, to the best of your abilities. If somebody 
used to getting a shower first thing in the morning. Um, you know, we wouldn't try to shower that person in the evening. Or if somebody used to work the midnight shift and, and they're used to getting a shower late, um, that might be something that is still familiar to them. And we also have to recognize, again, part of that life story, if the person that you're caring for may have had a past trauma, it's extremely important to share that with caregivers and care partners and, um, and be sensitive to, to that individual's um, you know, experiences. So we talk about reasons, some of the obvious reasons why you know, someone is throwing something uh, across the room. I throw things because someone else is being too loud. Uh, I'm trying to make the noise stop. Maybe as a child, you know, I would throw a bottle at a cat that was loud in the alley. Um, I use these examples because I, I want care partners to not just look at um, an expression of emotion as an immediate reaction or response. Because sometimes th there's, there's true action behind the expressions that we're seeing. And if we can kind of connect those dots, it helps us understand. So if someone's hypersensitive to sound, they, they might physically react or respond because it's too overwhelming and they've lost the ability to, to say, please, that's annoying me or please stop. Um, some things that are not obvious, um, I don't want the nurse's age to change my clothes. You know, um, if, you're, if you've got a, a loved one that, that might be in a retirement community or in a skilled facility, if that person is resistant to having someone touch them, we have to look at, again, that person's history the reason that they might not want the nurse to change their clothes, or if it's a female, a male caregiver to change their clothes, it might just be something as simple as no one in my life has seen me naked other than my parents and my spouse. And, um, and I think that's an extremely important thing for family caregivers um, to, to make sure that they convey um, those preferences to any professional staff that's providing care or support to their loved one. And we always make sure that we're searching for meanings in behavior. Um, what is the need that's not being met? Is there a physical need that, that we need to investigate and look into? Is there a psychological need um, that we need to be sensitive to? Or is there an advanced human need, um, such as love, trust, or fear? And we're going to kind of break into that a little bit, um, because I really do want to challenge you all today to Put your thinking caps on and, and consider all of these factors when we look at these different influences. So when we first look at the physical influences to, you know, why you might have uh, a loved one or someone that you're caring for have an expression of emotion, we have to look at things like poor eyesight or hearing loss. Both can be very isolating and can cause a lot of frustration. Um, so it's extremely important that, um, that we recognize those factors and that we look into opportunities to engage that person that has this challenge with their eyesight or with their hearing. Um, we also look at progressive loss of cognitive or physical abilities. We want to make sure that we are setting people up to succeed, that we're meeting them where they are, not only cognitively, but physically, and we're adapting ourselves in order to help that person find dignified success. Oftentimes, we have to remind people that when somebody has cognitive challenges, we cannot expect them to conform to what's gonna make our day easier. We have to remember that as caregivers and care partners, we need to move like water, like, like fluid um, through every vein and, and through every avenue. Um, we need to be flexible to meet the needs of the person that we're caring for and setting them up for success um, by making sure that we're not only meeting them cognitively, but physically where they are. We also need to recognize and be very vigilant with medication, recognizing medication side effects because it can, it can affect not only just these three things that I have listed, balance, gait, and appetite, but I also want you to remember and recognize this. If you're on a new medication, you're able to make those needs known. Hey, this makes me feel lightheaded or my stomach's upset or I feel dizzy or I have diarrhea. Um, but the person that has a cognitive challenge that has you know, Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, they might not be able to verbalize to you how 
um, something is making them feel, especially when there's a medication side effect or change. So always remind people, just be really vigilant when you know that there's gonna be a med change and, and observe it and track it. Um, we talk about fatigue um, that happens with broken sleep patterns. The noises that we make as caregivers, we don't realize sometimes that we're being noisy and, um, and we might be affecting the sleep patterns of the person that we're caring for. Um, physical pain, such as chronic pain or restlessness, physical illness, um, you know, sometimes the their endings are just so hypersensitive and, and especially with people with, uh, with dementia, um, their skin is so thin. And so oftentimes, um, you know, just the way we touch somebody um, can trigger a, a physical in, influence to pain um, or discomfort. Um, I, I wrote elastic pants on here for a reason, because again, when we're talking about somebody with dementia, Sometimes they're not able to shift in their chair or, you know, pull that elastic waistband and, and make more room or make themselves more comfortable. Um, so that's something as caregivers that we really always should be monitoring and double checking is the comfort level of the clothing that we have on our loved ones, because that can cause a very big physical influence to negative reactions. And then when we look at um, environmental influences, noises, television, pots, pans, radios. Um, I always tell everybody, um, when you're caring for somebody that has dementia, it's really important that you put the, the most meaningful and engaging sounds and, and stimulants, like their favorite music or things that really stimulate them um, towards the late morning, early afternoon. And then as the day goes on, those kind of stimulants should start to tone down and, and be more relaxing and, and, and calmer um, because these are just simple ways to kind of help that person with dementia ease back into the evening. Um, so we wanna make sure that you know any type of noise, whether it's music, radios, um, or just energy in general um, it, it is toned down as the day goes on. Um, lack of personal items or environmental cues. I always tell people, you know, if you're considering a retirement community, you want to make sure that the space that you're placing your loved one in their, their apartment or their bedroom um, is a reflection of the space that reminds them of who they are and who loves them and who they love. Um, so personalizing things. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of taking pictures right off the wall and, 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 and having them in my, my hands, in my lap, and, and talking about the life story or the picture um, and recreating the memory um, with somebody who has dementia. Um, that's a wonderful opportunity to engage them um, with using pictures or you know, clothing, um, things that are soft, things that are sensory. I don't know if you guys can see behind me, there's a cat up on the shelf. It's a, it's a dementia cat. Um, and we use that for people who are nonverbal um, as a stimulant to help them, you know, connect to uh, something from their past if they were pet lovers. Um, oftentimes, too, we have to recognize temperature, extreme temperatures in room. Um, some people like it really warm. Some like it really cool. Uh, food temperature, um, liquids, pots, colds. We have to be very vigilant and make sure that we are making sure that things are the right temperature because somebody with dementia might not be able to tell you, you know, this is burning me or, you know, this is too cold. Um, so it's really important that we as care partners are always thinking four and five steps ahead of our loved ones. So that way um, we're, like I said earlier, setting them up for success and, um, and helping build that connection so that they feel bonded to us. Um, disembodied voices such as the television being on in a different room um, or radio uh, or anybody talking. Um, oftentimes the perception is that they're talking about me or um, they're, they're judging me. Um, so as people decline in the disease process, please remember disembodied voices or talking in front of them to someone else about them. Um, it can really trigger in somebody with dementia, those feelings of being judged and, um, and embarrassed or frustrated. And so they may react negatively. Um, 
So again, I just, I always caution everybody and just be mindful of the space that you're placing your loved one in. Um, make sure that they have a view of the room or a view of the space so that they feel comfortable in that space. And then we talk about social and emotional influences. Um, sometimes people with dementia can perceive caregivers, neighbors, or family members as people uh, from their past. Um, so I want you to think about it this way. Things that happen in real time can trigger feelings, memories, and emotions from the past as if it's real and true in that moment. Um, sometimes with dementia, it's almost like a deja vu experience. And, um, you know, I might have the same name as someone's daughter. So therefore, in that moment, even though I don't look like their daughter, they make me their daughter because I have the same name or I might look like somebody's wife or look like someone's granddaughter. And in that moment, symbolically, that's who I become to them. And um, so again, I think it's really important that we recognize that um, when you're caring for somebody that has dementia, it's like they can become time travelers. They might have one foot in reality and they might have one foot in the past where those feelings and those emotions kind of stir up again in them. Um, so people who just don't get along, that can happen too, you know, whether we have dementia or not, sometimes just reading body language of another person, um, we can tell if that's favorable to our situation or not. And just because somebody has a, you know, an illness or, uh, you know, a situation where they, they do need care and they do need support, but they're uncomfortable in that situation. I think it's extremely humbling um, for a caregiver or care partner to be able to say, you know what, I'm not who they need right now. And so I'm going to step out so that this person can get the care that they need in this moment. And I think that's very important that we all um, recognize that in ourselves and in the, in the people that um, we may, you know, have assisting us in providing care and support. Um, I think it's also important that we look at lack of personal or meaningful activities. Um, this can really strum up a lot of boredom, uh, restlessness. This also can trigger wandering, anxiety, um, self-stimulation, behavior such as yelling. Um, again, we want to make sure that there's a perfect balance in what we're trying to do um, to care for somebody that has any form of dementia. Um, so taking a look at ourselves, um, you know, if I were to say to you, okay, everybody take your shirt off right now, every single person on the zoom would be like, she's insane, not taking my shirt off. Right. So imagine that being the person who has dementia, you know, somebody walks in to provide personal care to them. Um, their first instinct is fight or flight. How do I make this person get away from me? How do I make this person not touch me? Um, so we wanna remember that there's always an altered view of reality. Um, oftentimes a person with dementia, they wake up in the morning and they truly believe that every decision that they've made has been the right decision for them. And it can be very stressful when a caregiver or care partner is telling them, oh, that's not right, that's not right. Do it this way, try it that way, let me help you. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're sensitive to the fact that when they wake up each morning, they truly do believe that they're doing everything correctly. Um, we want to also remember that about 80 to 85 percent of negative reactions that we see from people that have dementia are triggered by poor approach by the care partner or the caregiver. And also, we also want to recognize that rushing somebody to any type of activity of daily living, such as getting dressed or brushing their teeth, that never works. When you try to rush somebody that has dementia, it actually has the opposite effect. It slows them down. You know, they might be afraid of falling or they might be afraid that, um, you know, the situation that you're, you're placing them in is going to be stressful or overwhelming. And so they, they shut down. Um, so we also want to remember our own body language. As people lose the verbal ability to communicate, those keen observations kick in. And so people with dementia, they read our body language. They know when we as caregivers are stressed. And if, if somebody is, is experiencing stress or frustration and they step into the room to provide care and support, 
that person with dementia might see them coming towards them and think they're mad at me, or, um, you know, I, I don't want to be around that person. And they can be resistive to care. So we always want to make sure that we center ourselves, that we take a deep breath, and we just allow ourselves to be who they need us to be in those moments so that they feel safe in the care that we're about to provide for them. Because you never want to be the reason why we trigger a negative reaction or behavior. So we talk about leaving your ego at the door. And it's important that caregivers recognize, like I said, that the, the disease process will sometimes and oftentimes disengage the person. And we also wanna recognize that it's not willful misconduct when somebody with dementia does not react and respond to what we're trying to do or, or help them do. Um, they're not choosing to be stubborn or the lack of knowledge um, as to how to react and, and behave. Um, we're taking care of grown adults who've lived full lives. And when they choose to not do something, it doesn't always mean, like I said, that um, if they've lost those abilities um, for social uh, reactions, it just might be that, you know, we're approaching them in the wrong way, or we aren't meeting the needs or goals that they have set for themselves at that moment. Um, so we must try to understand the cause of the behavior um, and what that person is trying to communicate to us. And this is the part where I always um, I really like to make sure that all of you, um, if you're not already doing this, I strongly encourage you to pick yourselves up a journal and really start to write things down. When you begin a journal, um, it helps you to, and it says it right here, describe in detail what is happening. Um, so you want to jot down the things that you see, every single thing that you see that's happening with your loved one will help you determine if there is a physical problem. Like I said, is there a new medication? Is your loved one experiencing illness or pain? Is there a problem with the sleep pattern? Um, hunger or thirst? Oftentimes people with dementia are not able to communicate to us that they are thirsty. And so I think it's extremely important that if your loved one doesn't have the ability to get themselves a drink, we're always providing opportunities for hydration. Um, I always say input, output. Anytime someone uses the, the restroom facility, you want to make sure that you're offering them a drink as soon as they have output. Um, so you're looking at, you know, when they, when they wake up, when they're eating breakfast, when they're, you know, maybe before lunch, after lunch, during lunch, uh, mid-afternoon, late afternoon, the dinner meal, evening, you always want to make sure that there's hydration. Um, because when somebody is not able to let you know that they are hungry or thirsty, this is when they really can dehydrate um, and then they can become disoriented. So on top of any dementia that they might have, they may also become disoriented because of that lack of hydration. Um, and also too, as I said earlier, um, you always wanna be monitoring the clothing to make sure that it's not too tight or too loose. If it's too loose, that person may risk falling. Now, if it's too tight, then they also may risk falling if they're trying to remove those clothing. Um, so you also wanna think about what is happening and you wanna jot it down as well. Is there an environmental situation? Um, you want to note the time of when your loved one has an expression of emotion um, and what the trigger is that's causing it to happen. Um, sometimes it's where it happens, you know, a certain room or a certain place in time. Um, sometimes it might be a, a certain person is present um, and that might also cause a trigger um, in, in the environment. Um, noise, lighting. Um, I think lighting is extremely important. We want to make sure that um, you're not having a, an environment or a room that casts too many shadows. I'm always begging people, remove the area rugs in your home. That's the last thing you want to do is, is have area rugs. Um, you want to make sure that things are well lit and that there is space to navigate. Uh, we also think about um, describing more things in detail uh, about what is happening. So is there a social or an emotional problem? Again, who is around? 
what emotion is being expressed. Um, is, the, is the behavior or the expression of emotion hurtful? Um, and what is the caregiver's approach? Um, a lot of this stems from just humbling ourselves. Um, somebody might be able to teach us a better approach um, you know, to care that we are doing now. Uh, I remember once I was working with a lady and she said, I just cannot get my husband into the shower. And so I asked her if she'd ever considered getting in with him and, um, and it worked and, uh, and she was able to help him get a shower. Um, and for the longest time, he was really resistive. And so she'd put on her swimsuit and he'd put on his, and that's how she helped him get a shower. Um, so again, I think a lot of times it's thinking outside the box and, um, and being brave to try new things. Sometimes they might be strange, but I always think that, you know, when there's a will, there's a way. So step two, identifying your loved one's possible needs and describing them in detail. Again, you wanna make sure you're writing all this stuff down in your journal to determine if your loved one uh, or the person that you're caring for is overstimulated. Um, and are they understimulated? Because that can happen too. Um, somebody is bored if they don't feel productive, uh, if they're not feeling useful. Um, are they feeling lonely? Uh, you know, do they need somebody to listen to them? You know, sometimes we're, we're, we as caregivers do all the talking and, um, and we don't realize that it's extremely important uh, to do some listening as well. Listening to not just their verbal language, but to their body language. Um, does that person feel safe? Any recent changes that may cause them to not feel safe? Are they lacking a feeling of independence or control? Um, I think this is an extremely important thing that I'd like to share with you about what I just said. Are they lacking a feeling of independence or control? Oftentimes, especially young caregivers, they don't often think to ask the person that they're caring for their opinion on things. How do you like this to, to happen? What do you think about this? Am I doing this correctly? Asking for feedback, asking for guidance. And even if the person is extremely challenged um, cognitively, it's still extremely important to ask them their opinion, ask for guidance, ask for support. As caregivers, again, it's a very humbling thing and it's a very important and dignified way to provide safe care. Um, especially if we do recognize that you see here, if that person has a low self-esteem, if they're emotionally fragile, we wanna make sure that you know, we're including them in the care. And then we also wanna make sure that we're listing that, that person, that, that loved one or, or that person, that caregiver, care partner's strengths. Um, and you wanna describe their strengths in detail. You wanna jot down as much as you know um, you want to identify your loved one's likes and their abilities. Building on their likes and abilities to incorporate that into daily life, especially if they have a negative reaction um, and that, that negative behavior begins to stir in them. Um, an example would be singing. Try singing in the shower if they're prone to not wanting to take a shower. I think it's extremely important that we recognize that music and movement go hand in hand. And when you have music and movement, that stirs memories. Music and memories and movement, I think, open up a world of opportunities for caregivers and care partners to be able to share experiences. Um, I talk in, in another seminar about the difference between doing two, doing four, and doing with. Most people who are cognitively fragile would prefer that we do things with them instead of do things to them or do things for them. And um, so I think I'll save that comment for a later day and hopefully we'll be able to share that. Um, so when we talk about validation method and, and validation method was uh, designed and, and developed by a woman named Naomi File, it's F-E-I-L and um, Naomi File developed validation method um, in, in a way and in order to reach people who have Alzheimer's disease and related dementia in a very non-pharmacological way of communicating with them to help them express their emotions and their needs to a capable, trusted, caring listener, someone that's not going to judge them, someone that's going to help them help themselves 
and express themselves through um, nonverbal and verbal forms of communication. Um, we talk about not just using validation method, um, but also empathetic redirection. And when you're using empathy, you're helping somebody to know that you understand what it feels like in that moment to be them and you're able to connect with them. Um, another option uh, for a great approach is to be able to change the caregiver. And again, it just stems from us taking a moment, taking a breath, stepping out um, and, and either allowing somebody else to come in and, and see if they can provide some, some support or just taking a few moments for yourself and, and saying to the person that you're caring for, you know, at this moment, I can tell that I'm really upsetting you. So I'm going to step aside a moment and then, you know, I'll come back. And uh, oftentimes you'll hear people uh, say, well, they always say they're going to come back, but they never come back. And that's the thing about validation method is we always say what we're going to do and then we follow through. Um, Reapproaching later can also help people to de-escalate a situation before it becomes a situation. Um, and we always wanna make sure that we're providing purposeful activities um, for the people that we're caring for in order for them to burn off as much energy as possible. Um, so that way they're able to sleep well at night. Um, and also when you provide purposeful activities, you're, you're, you're reinstilling dignity in somebody who is very fragile, you know, emotionally, physically, cognitively, and, um, and reminding them that, uh, that they're still part of this world that we live in and, um, and still part of this care. Um, and I always remind everybody, you don't have to do it alone. You know, I think that there's a large community out there. I, um, I, I see that through the Parkinson's Foundation, just how large your community is, and um, and you know, thrilled to be able to be here today and and help support and and provide information for anybody. Um, so I guess at this point I'll open it up to questions, and I'm going to shrink the screen at this point. Okay, Casey. That was really informative. I learned quite a bit, and I love how it's very focused on the person with dementia and a very positive way of interacting. And yes, we'd love to, well, I'll help with the questions, but um, open it up for questions. I have one question in the chat box, so I'll start with that one. And then it's, we're open to any more. Maureen, would you recommend care partners watch TIPA snow videos for tips on interacting with people with dementia? Yes, absolutely. So um, TIPA snow, I think she comes from a very similar um, standpoint in regards to dignified care um, that Naomi Files um, comes from. And um, with TIPA, it's, it's more of a PTOT background. And for Naomi, it's more of a, um, uh, a psychology background. And so when you kind of blend both together, um, you have, I, I believe, one of the most dignified um, and just truly humanistic forms of care and support. Uh, and, and so, yes, I, I do believe that um, when you're able to connect both, um, you know, there's, there's no way that you can, can fail your loved one. Mm. Thank you. I see another question in the chat box. Do you train people at Country Meadows in this method? I do, I do. And we also um, you know, provide opportunities for families to do seminars and, and for families to, to come out and, and you know, I can either do you know, one hour sessions, two, four hour sessions. Um, you know, I think the sky's the limit in regards to offering support to families. Um, you know, I've been, uh, I've been a volunteer for over 20 years. And I think that one of the most important things that, that we can do is, um, we always say at a country meadows, get to know us before you need us in, in hopes that you never need us, you know, um, but there's so many amazing caregivers and care partners that are caring for their loved ones at home. And I think it's important that 
um, that they feel supported and that they're able to do as much as they can for as long as they can. And um, yeah, I'm always willing to, to provide support and education to anybody. Thanks. There, there's a follow-up question to that one as well. Do these um, same techniques work in depression and apathy? They do. I think that's the, the beauty of, um, of non-judgmental care. And um, I mean, if you, if you ask Naomi File, Naomi will say, you know, that uh, validation method was developed for people who have um, Alzheimer's disease or related dementia that are age 80 and over. Um, but when you really look at um, the, the foundation principles of what it is, it's non-judgment. And it is stepping into not just someone's shoes, but really stepping into their heart. And, um, and I, I, I joke and say that, uh, you know, validation method works on teenagers and on young children and on husbands. Um, because when you think about it, every single person is worthy of non-judgment. Every single person is worthy of acceptance. And, um, and every single person is, is, um, is valued as an individual. And, uh, and like I said, I think that, you know, what, when you step into a space as a caregiver and you don't have an agenda, you know, mm. I'm, I'm here to be who you need me to be in this moment of trust and in this moment that is very fragile. Um, I think that, uh, it is a win-win for everyone, you know, it, because we're working smarter, not harder as care partners and caregivers. And, uh, and we're doing it in a very sensitive way. Hmm. I think that ties in nicely to leaving your ego at the door, leaving your agenda at the door. Yeah, it does. I know. Um, yeah. That, that's why I always tell people, you know, when, when you're, when you're working with somebody, um, and they're expressing themselves, you know, wait a minute, are you yelling to me? Or are you yelling at me? Mm. You know, cause there's, and if they say I'm yelling at you, then that's my immediate reaction is based on validation. I'll say, you know, have I let you down? Mm. What can I do to build trust with you again? And mm. it helps that person find more words and, and share, um, their feelings in that moment. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's, it's just a very vulnerable place that we put ourselves in. Um, I'll give you a good example of that. Um, because I think that it's, it's extremely powerful. Um, I was caring for a woman in a program that I was running and she needed a higher level of care. And so I worked with the family, um, to move her to a higher level of care. And that meant she had to move her apartment and, and moved from one building to another building. And um, I happened to be in the new building that, that day and, um, and she had dementia and she came right up to me and she shook her finger in my face and she said, you, you did this to me. And in, in that moment, I had no idea what she was talking about. And I said, I really let you down. I'm sorry. I said, I, I never mm -hmm. wanted to break trust with you. And she said, well, you did. We worked together. And I was running a program that she was a participant in, but again, we talk about real-time value. She didn't see herself as an elderly woman with dementia that was living in, the, in a program. She saw herself as a purposeful worker. She felt that she was like my assistant or my colleague. And, um, and I said to her, I said, I'm going to work so hard to earn your trust again. And she said, I'm so mad at you. And she walked away. And it, you know, it destroyed me inside because I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I care so much about this person. And then I was, you know, working with another resident, another person at Country Meadows. And all of a sudden I felt this big hug from behind. If anybody, and we've all experienced that where you're standing there and somebody hugs you from behind. And I went like this and I could just see it, it was this, this lady who had just yelled at me. And she was hugging me from behind. And she said, I love you, but I'm still mad at you. Mm -hmm. And I turned around and I could feel the lump in my throat. And I looked her straight in the eyes and I said, I'm going to work so hard to earn your trust again. You know, and, and I genuinely hugged her back. And in those moments and in that creative, poetic way, um, she was telling me 
wow, everything in my world changed and I'm in this new place and this new space and nothing's familiar except for you, but you're not here like you used to be. And that's what she was trying to say. And um, again, I think as, as care partners and caregivers, when, when we allow the person that we're caring for that's so cognitively fragile to still feel that connection to us and still feel human and treat them as the people that we know and love and care for and not as the label of the illness that they have, but truly see them as the individual that they were and as that they are, um, it helps us maintain those relationships long into end of life. You're really stepping into their shoes. You are, you have to. Thank you for that example. So um, someone that's attending mentions, um, we'll be moving to get a bedroom on first floor and downsize. I see how hard it is when visiting families to keep routines, take meds, even with alarms. How can I make the move easier with so many changes? Change of location for meds, for example? So I think it's important that you wanna communicate as much as you can because you're the advocate for your loved one. You are their voice when they're having a hard time expressing themselves. So you want to make sure that you share that life story with the care team that is going to be responsible and really paint that broad stroke picture of who your loved one is and what they need to be successful and empower that that team that's going to be providing the support to meet those needs. Um, I always say that um, when you're caring for someone with dementia, you want to ask permission to touch them before you touch them. Mm -hmm. You want to explain to them what's going to happen before it happens. You know, so I I wouldn't say, Casey, I'm here to be your caregiver today and I'm going to help you go into the bathroom and change your clothes and get you in the shower. That's too much talking, right? That's Charlie Brown's teacher. But it's, hi, Casey, I'm Maureen. I'm going to be your helper today. Come with me, let's go into the bathroom. I'm here to help you so that you don't fall down. You know, and it's just explaining to them in a a dignified yet simplistic way, what's gonna happen before something happens and giving them the opportunity to say, yes, I agree with you or no, I'm not ready for that right now. And if they're not ready for it, that's okay too. There's always that validation uh, method technique of reapproach later. Mm-hmm. Try again, different way. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, the, the person that's asking the question can definitely um, work on. It, it's hard to think four or five steps ahead all the time to prepare your loved one. But once you get in that rhythm, it really does help them feel safe and feel part of the experience. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And just to add to that question, my husband definitely has more cognitive issues on days when he's not feeling his best or he's more stressed or tired. This bad day that Parkinson's individuals sometimes have. Other days you would not even realize he has cognitive issues. Those are the days when he's struggling that I would use music and memory And I'm challenge you to go back to his high school days and play the music that he loved when he was a teenager. And maybe hand lotion massage, shoulder massage, neck massage, just anything to help um, Mm. relax the the body and the senses. Um, I I also love aromatherapy. I think that, um, you know, when you use a a good essential oil, um, not only will aromatherapy help the person that that is living with dementia, but it also helps the caregiver. Um, If you use an essential oil that is calming and and soothing. Um, So if you're in a care facility and you're able to have an essential oil um, diffuser, um, that also kind of settles the 
coworkers, the staff as well. Those are some great tips. Thank you. Absolutely. I have another question for you, Maureen. When someone is confused about who people are, including their regular caregivers, how do you re reassure them, let them know you are there to help them? Yeah, so while I think it's extremely important that we always, again, build those safety nets. And so, um, and I always share with people, I'm the daughter of a mother who's 90 that has um, mild cognitive impairment, which is the precursor to Alzheimer's disease. And I'm the youngest of five. So I make sure that when I call her on the phone, I, and her nickname is Patsy, and I've always called her Patsy, I, I say, you know, hello, Patsy, it's Maureen, your favorite child. And it makes her laugh, but it also reminds her I'm hers and I'm the youngest. And that builds our relationship. You know, when I walk in her house, I, I make the announcement, it's me, Maureen, your favorite child. Um, and I do it in a manner that is safe for my mom to go, oh, there's my girl. You know, um, and so I think sometimes as as uh, as, as care partners, um, we need to um, be sensitive to who is coming in. So if if I am the spouse and and my husband, you know, has Parkinson's and and has dementia, and Casey is my caregiver that's coming in our apartment, I would say, Hey, Joe, look, it's Casey. Casey's one of our favorite people. She comes in and she helps us get a shower and helps us to get dressed. How are you today, Casey? And I would keep using your name as you're coming closer. Um, then you, as the caregiver, would say, hey, Joe, it's me, Casey, your favorite caregiver, you know, um, or it's me, your friend, Casey. I think it's important that we do an anchored touch. And that's, that's something that's based on validation method. It's when you don't grab somebody, but you just cup their shoulder right here. And so if I am a female caregiver and I'm caring for a male resident, I would put my arm out and I would cup his shoulder and then I would extend a hand for a handshake. And I would say, hi, Joe, it's me, Casey. I'm here to see you today. And I think that an anchoring of a touch um, stimulates friendship, that mm -hmm. that anchored touch is, is a friend or sibling touch. And I think that when you, um, when you build that kind of social safety net. So that way the person with dementia knows, oh, okay, well, if my spouse trusts this person, then I can too. Helpful information. Do we have time for any more questions, Maureen? I know it's 102. Okay, I, I'm good to go if anybody has any other questions. We, we have time for one or two more questions. Thanks, Maureen. If anyone has anything, you can unmute yourself or type it in the chat box. And I will send a follow-up email with the recording of this wonderful webinar and also the presentation slides. And Maureen is happy to talk with you individually if you have any more um, specific questions. Okay, a clap. I've heard some really positive remarks. This is really helpful. And thank you so much, Maureen. Also, I know that you have some other topics that you may be able to um, talk about and on a future date. Absolutely. So and thank you so much for having me today. I, I really do appreciate uh, being able to offer some any type of support. Okay. And, and we'll yeah. be in touch. And you lived up to Laura's challenge of the high quality presentation. Uh, oh. You met the challenge. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Maureen. And Take thanks, care. Country Thank Meadows. you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.